Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Women of the Word podcast. I'm Lauren C. Santo. I'm here with my friend and Bible study teacher, Jen Wilkin. Jen, thanks so much for joining me today. I'm so excited to talk with you about all things Bible study. Me too. Really looking forward yes, to it. Yay. So the name of this podcast is actually the name of the, your first book, Women of the Word, which you wrote back in 2014. And that book was all about how women, although it really was for anybody, how they can learn to study the Bible with both their hearts and their minds. And that's what you and I are going to do together today. We're going to explore those topics, how we can know and love the Bible better and ultimately love the God who points to. So let's jump in. Jen, can you talk about why you wrote Women of the Word? Yeah, I was just doing ministry in my local church and was seeing an increased need for studies that were, this is going to sound terrible, but that were just actually getting into the scripture itself. Yeah. Um, when I was in my early 20s and had my first child and started like, ha finally, I wasn't working and had the opportunity to go to my church and attend women's Bible study. And pretty much the entire Bible study diet at that time for the women, at least in the church that I was in, were things that were topical or devotional in nature. Mm. And so they were, you know, picking verses from various areas in the scripture and then really telling us what we should think about them. And then our 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 work was to feel, to, to generate the feelings around that. And um, you know, we'll talk about this as we move through the podcast, I'm sure. There's a place for, for devotional and topical studies, but when it's the entire diet that you're getting, right, right. you end up with this whole population of women who have been in church, in, in many cases for many years, going to something called a Bible study, and they still don't know mm. the Bible. So I was just growing increasingly alarmed about it. Um, I have an English degree. I'm not formally theologically trained, but I couldn't understand why when we came to the Bible, we didn't treat it essentially like a book. We were treating it like something else. Um, and you had this whole group of women in the church. I mean, the church is made up more than 50% of the church is female, right? Right. Uh, but women's discipleship, this is a little bit of an umbrella issue that was associated with it. Women's discipleship was rarely viewed as part of a holistic Christian uh, formation strategy. Yeah. It was it was just kind of over to the side doing its own thing. Yeah. So yeah, that was kind of where things were when I started thinking about this issue and started trying to write my own content and come up with a method that was going to actually teach literacy skills. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, anybody who's heard you speak or write or talk at a conference has probably heard you talk mm -hmm. about Bible literacy mm -hmm. and your heart for Bible literacy. Mm -hmm. So can you just talk a little bit about what Bible literacy is and why you're so passionate about it? Yeah, I do like to distinguish, sometimes people will say biblical literacy, and that's not a terrible term, mm. but it's not precise enough for me because a lot of times you have people who have some form of biblical literacy in the sense that they might know some content that's in the Bible oh, sure. uh, or idea, you know, they might know some doctrine or things like that. But Bible literacy is simply having a book of the Bible in a language that you can understand and you're growing toward mastery of it. And by mastery, it just means you know how to read it the way that it was intended to be read. Yeah. And um, and so that was a that's a big missing piece for yeah. a lot of people. Um, they 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 have have this book that they're staking their lives on, right. but in in a lot of cases they've just taken someone else's word for for what it says. So from your perspective, what is the state of Bible literacy in the church today? Mm -hmm. Well, I think since 2014, I would say we've seen some improvement, which is really gratifying. And I'm not saying that that's just because of Women of the Word by <laughs> well. any stretch, but I think there are more voices out there. I don't know if we had reached the tipping point, you know, in, in, in at least in women's circles where women were hungry for more. And I don't mean to, um, to remove the the debt that we owe to, you know, organizations like BSF and yeah. CBS and, um, and, um, precept who have done this kind of work for a long, long time. But there wasn't, there was not just a general sense in women's circles, at least of, wow, I really, I don't, I don't know how to read this thing. Mm. And it was a, it was, I've called it sort of the dirty little secret that we were all keeping and no one wanted to admit. Yeah. And so I, I think you hear more conversation around Bible literacy. I think there are more resources out there for women yeah. at varying levels that are helping them build Bible literacy than there were in 2014. But I think that it is such a big problem and mm. it lives as a subset of a literacy problem in our society that we will be fighting this fight for years to come. 
Do you think it's something that today, I know you said it's gotten a little bit better in the, than in the past, but comparatively to a few generations to go, do you think we're better off than we were then or has it gotten worse over the last 20, 30 years? Oh, over the last 20 or 30 yeah. years, I think it's certainly gotten worse. Yeah, I mean, and it's not just biblical uh, literacy that's dropped, it's theological literacy as well. You know, we're seeing yeah. that in all of our markers. And I think you look around, I, I, I'm very sensitive toward the deconstruction conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, people mm -hmm. who are deconstructing their faith, I don't look on that um, with anger or disgust or anything. Yeah. I have a, a ton of compassion for people who are walking through that process. But um, when I hear the questions that they're wrestling with, um, I, I tend to think, I, I hear you wrestling with a faith that I don't know that you were ever given. Like, I don't know that you ever were given your Bible and shown this is how you can look for these answers on your own. And I don't mean in isolation, but I mean, if we if we don't have that first layer of firsthand knowledge of the text, yeah. then it's no wonder that when we hear an idea that we have dissonance with, that, that we think, I'm the first person in human history who's ever had yeah. this soul-sucking question, and I'm going to have to jettison everything right. uh, in order to reconcile the way that I feel. And so I do think that um, we're seeing that in a lot of those deconstruction conversations, and I think Bible literacy is a big start yeah. toward helping someone recognize, oh, I have a historic faith. I have a, a, a faith that I can really uh, lean into. And so I think there's that piece with regard to deconstruction, but then I also think when you see just the fractiousness in Christian circles mm -hmm. around uh, different ideas from the Bible, um, sometimes I think people think my end game with Bible literacy is if we all knew how to read it better, we would all agree. And that's actually not what I think. I do think that around orthodoxy, right, things that are in that yeah, close right. orthodoxy, that we would have more clarity and less fighting. But uh, all of those secondary and tertiary issues, I don't actually think that if we all get more literate, we'll agree on them. I think we will disagree far more charitably mm. than we do now because we begin to recognize uh, our own our own place in this and, and yeah. our own perspective is, is just limited and that we need each other to hash these things out. Yeah, that's really helpful. So Jen, how did you first catch a vision for Bible literacy? Who in your life kind of set an example for you about that? Well, I grew up in a home that was filled with books and reading and then went off and studied English. And so I knew how to read books in general mm -hmm. and then began to feel a distance between the way that you would read just any book and the way that we read the scriptures. Now, obviously the Bible is more than a book, but it is a book, right? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so I had started into women's Bible study spaces in these topical or devotional um, rooms and they were meeting a need uh, of some kind, but they weren't necessarily growing people in their knowledge of the scriptures the way that I had had exposure to. Even as a kid, we were in a Bible church for a period of time, mm -hmm. and our junior high Bible study was doing basically line by line Bible study. So I knew it was a thing. I hadn't yeah. seen it in a while. And then right. I was invited to an inductive Bible study, and I got into that room, and I was like, oh my gosh, these are my people. Because inductive Bible study is essentially just taking literacy tools that you would use with any book and then using them to address the Bible at a literature level level, not just at a literature level, but at least at a literature level. Yeah. And um, so I began to wonder why were there only 20 women in this inductive space and then there were, you know, 200 in this yeah. other space. And I just was, I couldn't figure out why, where all of these really great tools were, was all of the energy in, in this other space and, and isn't there a way for these two rooms to to talk to each other, to have a to have a common shared space, a space where um, the tools are being given to students, and then the evident love for teaching and the um, the really um, hard hitting application yeah. is all connecting. And at least in the church that I was in, there there was there were not any overlaps there. So I started trying to write and teach for a middle middle space. So do you think that there's anybody who would get a pass on Bible literacy, or do you think Bible literacy is really just for everybody? Well, I have to say I have seen it at, at every level. Uh, you, you know, you work in publishing, you yeah. know you <laughs> know how books get all the way through the publishing right. cycle with, with so many different eyes on them and, and things get out into the world that where verses are used out of context or passages or 
uh, misquoted. I mean, it could be anything. Uh, people take a story and use it however they want. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, and so, uh, and then, you know, I've done a ton of traveling around and teaching on this, and one of the things that I'll do sometimes when I uh, do a session is I give everybody a pop quiz over 20 just basic factual questions in the Bible. So it's not interpretation or application. Okay. It's just like, um, what kind of animal did Balaam ride? Which that's actually the gimme question and yeah. all of it. Uh, and, and people can't do it. Yeah. And they feel that sinking feeling. Mm. And I'm talking about, you know, people at Christian conferences with seminary degrees, right. people who are in local churches. I think that um, because we have such access to things that are Bible adjacent, uh, many of us have lost a habit of actually spending time in the Bible, yeah. uh, making meditation just on the words that are there. Yeah. I think it's everywhere. Yeah, I see that even a lot just in my own church and with my own friends of, it's easier almost to like recommend a book or oh, absolutely. a podcast to listen to about the Bible mm -hmm. rather than actually getting into the Bible for themselves. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I understand that too. What would you say maybe to those people who think like, it's just, it's easier to read a book about the Bible or mm -hmm. I like this person or this author, so I'm gonna listen to this podcast and getting into the Bible feels like really intimidating to me. What would you say to the person that feels intimidated by just the prospect of Bible literacy or studying the Bible for themselves. Well, I think it is intimidating, especially if you don't have any sense of where to start, you know, which is what Women of the Word was written to help people with, to give them a starting point. But um, I, I do think that people uh, don't recognize that you can't possibly read with any level of personal discernment if you don't have that underlying knowledge of the scripture. Mm -hmm. And that all of these things that are about the Bible are uh, helpful, not all of them, but many of them are helpful, yeah. but they're not foundational. And not only that, but they are assuming that you have a foundational understanding of the scriptures if they are wanting to be truly beneficial. But then even, this is kind of scary, some mm -hmm. of them are actually relying on you not having a foundational <laughs> understanding because then they can tell you whatever their interpretation is and, and you're gonna take their word for it. Yeah, you don't know either way. Yeah, if that's yeah. and so um, I do think that for people who think I can't do this, mm -hmm. that that's one of my my main missions in yeah. ministry is to diminish what I've sometimes called the expert amateur divide, mm -hmm. that the expert stands on a platform or uh, is on a podcast or, or authors a book and tells you things and you receive them. You're the amateur, you sit in the pews. And for many of us, this is the way that Sunday morning plays out yeah, you know, each week. Right. We come and we sit and we receive teaching over a passage that we've spent very little time in ourselves, if any, before we hear the, the sermon preached. Yeah. And it's a passive learning environment. And when we get to the end of hearing that sermon, we don't think, oh, now I understand this passage better and I can just get through it on my own. We think, that's amazing. How did that expert mm. put that together? Uh, and, and so what Bible literacy does is it pulls back the curtain and mm -hmm. says, hey, we actually want you to know how yeah. this person did the work that they did because we're all called to be disciples who make disciples. Right. And so, you know, really uh, so much of uh, the conversation around Bible literacy from my perspective is to be able to faithfully fulfill the part of the Great Commission mm -hmm. that has been forgotten for 30 or 40 years. And that's that we're to make disciples and teach them to observe all that he commanded. So the work of being a disciple is the business of learning. The work of being a discipler is yeah. the business of instructing others. Yeah, and it kind of gives people a little bit of the bigger picture. It's not just Bible literacy for your quiet times, but it impacts your discipleship with your friends and coworkers and neighbors and also how you attend church and are a church member it's not just kind of what you do <laughs> well for yourself too. And you know, you've really mentioned one of the, you've alluded to what I think is uh, are two of the biggest challenges that we're facing in the church today. I've started calling them the two eyes that we need to gouge out because they both start with an eye. <laughs> and um, the first one is individualism. Uh, in other words, uh, and, and this is very deep in the quiet time ethos. Mm. It's me, the Lord, and my Bible. That's the sweet sauce. That's the most important time I can spend interacting with the scriptures. And then the instant gratification piece is mm. me, the Lord, and my Bible, and I need what I need from it right now. 
Right. And that's, you know, those are symptomatic of the cult, of the broader culture that is telling us that it's my personal experience of it and, and my feelings in the moment that are defining whether something is a value or not. So a lot of the work that, that requires to be done around Bible literacy in the church is to restore to us delayed gratification yeah. and a sense that the Bible, while it is written for me, it's it's really foundationally written for us, for the children of right. God, and that it's understood in community, not just in isolation. Yeah, and then that there's some effort that goes into yeah. to that. There's That's work right. that it's not just I can read the Bible and immediately get everything yeah. from the five minutes that I've mm -hmm. read or you know, we'll talk about that in other episodes too, just yeah. of the desire to maybe want to read the Bible to feel better, solve a problem, find help for something. Mm -hmm. But I think that's also kind of a, a challenge for people too is um, I just want to like go to the Bible, read what I need to read, get my quiet time, check it off the list, yep. move on with my life kind yeah. of thing. And that's not building a lot of healthy habits. Yeah. Yeah. So what would you say to the person who thinks, Jen, I'm just not cut out for this. I just don't think this is something that I can do. Yeah. Well, usually that's rooted in some past negative experience <laughs> in which they felt, you know, they felt yeah, like they right. were not capable or they felt shame or embarrassment around uh, the way that they had tried to interact mm -hmm. with the Bible. And um, it's true that we all have varying levels of uh, ability to understand. I mean, some of us do have a, a greater aptitude. Some of us have, you know, learning challenges that we're up against. Mm -hmm. um, but we have a little phrase, uh, my friends and I, where we say the Bible is for everyone. And that's true. The yeah. Bible is for everyone to the extent that you have the ability to understand it. You, you should try because yeah. the Lord has given that to us as a gift. And so um, there are good access points. And sometimes we weren't ever sort of brought in through the the front door and so we feel like we don't know why we feel so clunky at it um, and it's really a confidence builder over time if you start with basic tools that really are accessible to just about anyone and then learn how to use them well second uh, timothy 2 15 most people in this space would know that verse yep. um, that we're to do our best to present ourselves as workers who are unashamed as those who understand how to rightly handle the scriptures that's a call on the life of every follower of Christ, I believe. And so we can know that to whatever extent we do have the ability that we should pursue that. And I think for many of us, we don't even know what the extent of our ability would be because we may have had an initial first experience in which we did feel dumb or inadequate. So a lot of this I want women to have tools. I want people to have tools for reading the scripture, but I also want them to have confidence that, that they can do the work. Jen, have you personally ever been in that position where you think, oh, I, I don't even know if I know what I'm doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I still feel that way. Yeah. Honestly, I hope it comes across in, in my teaching and in the way that I'm talking about the Bible. I really do consider myself, and I think a lot of teachers do consider, I consider myself a co-learner. Mm. And that doesn't mean that I don't know that I've had more time or more experience. I do know that, but I always think that the one who's teaching is usually uh, the one who maybe had just a little more natural curiosity to, to keep pushing through where someone else might have said, oh, I don't know. Yeah. To me, that's probably the definition of a, of a teaching gift is just this, you had more of a natural curiosity to keep pressing when you mm -hmm. hit that first barrier. But honestly, every time I start a new book of the Bible, I it feels like climbing a mountain. It does. And I just think there's no way that that I'm going to be able to get through it all. And, and, and then you start to get into it and you realize, oh, the goal is not mastery. Like yeah. it's, it's about incremental gains, right? Incremental right. gains across a long timeline. And that's every bit as freeing for me as it is for the person who's contemplating this for the first time. Nobody has to be an expert. You can come and learn basic tools so that we can be co-learners, disciples walking this road together. What are a few maybe practical steps that people could start taking today? If they're listening to this and they're thinking, I, I don't feel like I have a great grasp of my own Bible literacy, what are some really practical things people can do today to start improving that in their own lives? The simplest first step is I think it sounds so simple that people think that can't possibly yeah. be useful, <laughs> uh, but uh, the most underutilized and helpful tool in building 
better literacy mm -hmm. is repetitive reading. Mm. Um, and repetitive reading of an entire book of the Bible from start to finish. And so, um, you know, there are value, there's value to different paces of reading the scripture. You know, maybe people have done a Bible reading plan, yeah. which is fantastic. It gives you, you know, that's the sprint. Uh, and then the Bible literacy piece, while that isn't, while a, a Bible reading plan is an aspect of building literacy, what I have focused on more with the, the space that I'm in is the marathon approach. It's to pick a book, stay in it, and really just spend enough time to where it gets under your skin, not to where you necessarily understand every single piece of it or know exactly what to do with all of it, but you know what it says. Yeah. And repetitive reading is an indispensable, it's the first step and it's an indispensable step in growing more familiar with this book that honestly we're staking our lives on. And it's amazing how little of it it takes before you begin to hear some of the things you were consuming passively mm. very differently than you did before. You begin to realize, I think that's pulled out of context or that's actually not what that verse says, you know, yeah. when someone is sort of paraphrasing something on the fly. And you may not immediately draw some stunning conclusion from that, but that's actually a really encouraging moment when you begin to realize that your awareness is being heightened uh, and you're growing more discerning in the things that you're hearing. You know, I, we talked a little about how I started creating resources mm -hmm. uh, to address Bible literacy, but really my why in all of this is because I grew up in about seven different denominations. Mm -hmm. I talk about it a little bit in the book. Yeah. And uh, when you know that there's always someone standing behind a pulpit or a podium using the same book, but teaching very different things from it, depending on what room you're in, right. that's a little alarming. And not only that, in my own family, in my immediate family, false teaching took a hold mm -hmm. with, um, with my mom. She uh, ended up in the Word Faith Movement mm -hmm. for a number of years, and she had a chronic health issue. Wow. And so... You can imagine when you have a loved one who felt that seeking medical attention was an act of faithlessness yeah. and was dealing with a medical issue that needed to be treated. When I say that false teaching is dangerous, I don't just mean spiritually dangerous, although it certainly is that. In the case of my own family, it was physically dangerous, wow. and which is to say nothing of the emotional right. and spiritual dangers associated with being told if you are ill, it's your fault. And and if you if things go well for you, it's because you've done things well, right? It's Christian right. karma. Right. And um, so when I think about people knowing the scriptures uh, firsthand and being able to rightly divide, being able to hear something and think critically about it, it's, it's intensely practical for yeah. me. It's not just a, an intellectual exercise at all. Thinking back over your experience as a Bible study teacher, how has the Lord grown your understanding of His Word as you've taken time to really get into it and study it for yourself? Well, I think like a lot of Christians, I had spent all, a fair amount of time in the New Testament, but the Old Testament felt scary and weird to totally. me. And like I knew intellectually that the God of the New Testament and the God of the Old Testament were the same, but I wasn't sure I could have proven it to you if yeah. I had had to, right. you know, by yes. taking you to the Old Testament. And so I've had the opportunity to teach through Genesis and Exodus uh, Joshua, Judges, First and Second Samuel. I've spent a fair amount of time in the last 10 or 15 years in Old Testament books, um, Proverbs and Psalms. And uh, the way that my understanding of the New Testament has just exploded, as I, which makes sense. You yeah, know, we definitely. know that we need the Old Testament to right. understand the New Testament, but I have lived through the curve at this point yeah. and will continue to, I'm sure, for as long as the Lord gives me uh, life. But I'm working now on a study of Revelation and I am seeing just increasingly like so many Christians think that book is off limits to them. Like if there's any book in the yeah. Bible that we need someone else to tell us what right. it means, it's that one, right? Yes. But yes. all of the years that I've gotten to spend in these Old Testament books are yielding up this fruit where I'm able to see the connections, not all of them, but mm -hmm. more than I would have 15 years yeah. ago, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, which is that idea of incremental gains. Right. And, and then I get excited about if I've, if I've got this much more understanding now, how much more will I have 10 years from now yeah. if I keep putting deposits into this? And so, um, yeah, for, for me personally, my 
my excitement and joy has grown as my ability to read has grown, as I've gotten better at seeing through the lenses, mm -hmm. those Old Testament, seeing the New Testament through those Old Testament lenses, the way that it was you know, written by those authors to be read. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. What an encouragement, and hopefully encouragement for other people that they know that they can also yeah. do this too. There is a lot of really exciting benefits. Lord blesses our efforts as we take time to learn his yeah. word. So is there anything else you would say about, you kind of touched on this a little bit, about why Bible literacy is worth the effort? Some people could be thinking, that sounds like a lot of work mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. uh, why? What other encouragement would you give people of why it's worth the effort? It is a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> it's the joyful work of a lifetime. And I think that, um, you know, we think about the Christian life as one of sacrifice, right? Like right. when we come to faith, we expect that it's going to mean we're going to use our money differently. It might be costly in terms of the way that we spend our time serving others. Yeah. Um, when we read the words of Jesus to take up our cross and follow him, it conjures a lot of in images of self-sacrifice mm -hmm. um, and discipline. But when we think about the scriptures, for some reason, we, we don't associate any costliness with being able to uh, understand what's in them. Yeah. In fact, it's always fascinating to me to see how people respond to current forms of media, current mm -hmm. mediums that are giving the gospel story. So TV shows or movies. Sure. And there will be this sort of wave of energy among the Christian community of like, oh my gosh, it's finally going to happen. This is this this movie's going to come out or this TV series, and then everyone is going to finally understand yeah. what the good news of Jesus Christ is because they'll be able to see it. Mm. And you can hear how they're we're, we're unintentionally or unconsciously privileging a medium uh, to say this is what basically this is what God's been waiting for all of these millennia was for us to be able to put things on film so that people could understand. But the reality is that the eternal words of God were given to us as words in a book. You know that that is how He chose to do things. He could have He could have revealed truth to us any way, yeah. and He hasn't been sitting on His hands for two thousand years waiting for someone to develop the camera. Right. Which is not to diminish that some of those things that are created yeah, are beautiful course. and helpful, and may be the first point where someone does hear and understand the gospel. Yeah. Um, but the everyday walk of a Christian is one of discipline. That's a disciple and discipline. Those words are related to each other. Mm -hmm. And so we should expect that this is going to be a discipline for us as well, a really good and beneficial one. And really, there's nothing that we've ever undertaken in our lives that was of value that we didn't start out feeling like we were not good at. And then over time, as we returned and kept honing that skill, we got better at it. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, and then began to you know, derive not just benefit, but joy from the work. That's awesome. I think that's a great call to action, a great place to cap off our discussion for today and really set us up for the rest of the episodes that we're gonna be talking about after this. So thanks so much, Jen. And thanks again for joining us for the Women of the Word podcast. Tune in next week where Jen's gonna share some of the craziest excuses she's heard about why someone has come to a study unprepared. And we'll also look at overcoming some common barriers to Bible study. If you've enjoyed this conversation, please make sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode and we'll see you all here again next week.